and good morning. Sorry for the late start, everybody. Welcome to the first episode of the panel. Uh, today's topic is what is science fiction? So we're going to come back to that in a moment. But in the meantime, I have an awesome panel here. We're still waiting on Kat Rambo. She's having some technical issues, which I understand because she is taking time out from Emerald City Comic Con to join us. So we'll have to see. In the meantime, let my wonderful guests introduce themselves. Start in whatever order you guys like. That doesn't work. You have to tell us who's oh, talking. Yes, I know. You've all told yourself because you started talking, John, so you're first. Hi, I'm John Scalzi. I uh, am a former president of SIFWA, and I do write science fiction. Yeah, we're glad to have you here. Next one on my list here. And uh, you know what? I don't know what to call you because you're, you were introduced uh -huh. to me as Divya. Yes. Right? And then, but your pen name is SB Divya, right? So Sure. There's a story behind that. <laughs> cool. Go for it. All right. I am SB Divya. I am also an author of science fiction. And uh, before that, for many, many years, I've just been an engineer and a science major. And I currently co-edit Escape Pod, a weekly science fiction podcast. My pen name is SB Divya, which is how uh, people in South India from my family write their names because we don't have family last names. So you can call me Divya. That is my first name. That is awesome. That is really cool. Welcome. So glad you could make it. Thank you. And then, Amy, you've been such a good sport this morning. We just <laughs> caught up with each other like 20 <laughs> minutes ago. So thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Like I said, I'm happy to be anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Amy J. Murphy. I also write science fiction. I'm a member of CIFWA. Um, I actually, I happen to be an independently published author. So I kind of guess I snuck in under the radar, guys. <laughs> I think that's so cool. Like, kudos to you. It's very difficult to make the CIFWA requirements as an indie author. So good for you. That's awesome. Cool. Thanks. And then last, we have Alan. Hi, uh, I'm Alan Bailey. I am the creator, co-host, and producer for Alan and Jeremy versus Science Fiction. Um, and I uh, spent most of my career working as a trainer and an educator and various ways, everything from middle school to corporate technical training. I've done everything in between. <laughs> awesome. And um, thanks guys so much for being here. I'm so excited. I can't wait to get into this. So who wants to take a stab at it first? If not, I'm going to volunteer John. What is <laughs> science well, fiction? Our geez. opening salvo. <laughs> I was about to say, but as long as I'm going to be volunteered first, I guess I will go first. Um, I have a, I have a very sort of snarky way of, uh, determining whether something is, uh, science fiction or fantasy. Uh, and, uh, it's to ask the character, Hey character, that deus ex machina that you have on your belt, uh, <laughs> what is, what is it powered by? Uh, and if they say it is powered by, uh, the grace of Glorflin, uh, and forged in the fires of Mount Snorgniff, um, then it's fantasy. Uh, and if they say, well, no, it's actually powered by this neutronium battery that will last for 10,000 cycles, then it's science fiction. <laughs> so uh, more, more precisely, a lot of it uh, will frankly come down to what is the, uh, is there a rational basis for um, the speculative elements of the, of the work? If it has a rational basis, uh, then it's usually science fiction. If it does not have a rational basis, and by rational basis I mean things like uh, magic or powered by gods or something else like that, um, then it is very likely fantasy. And then, of course, those it gets messy and fuzzy from there. So that's my initial thing. I like that. I like that an awful lot. I think that makes a lot of sense to me. I'll come back to that because I have some questions about that, but that's cool. Okay. All right. Divya, what's your take? My take is somewhat similar. I I think the lines have blurred a lot recently in terms of, you know, we, we have this thing now called science fantasy, right? And Star Wars is the classic example of this is science fantasy. We're not really pretending that the laws of 
physics as we know it apply to this particular universe. But it's cool because lightsabers and hyperspeed, and that's awesome. So I don't know. I I kind of like going old school and saying science fiction is just an umbrella term for a lot of speculative fiction. It's when we posit, it's a story that posits something that doesn't exist today and says, what are the ramifications to our society or a future society or even a past society if that particular thing actually existed? How does that change people's lives or an individual's life? And that to me is really the heart of science fiction. Awesome. Cool. Okay, yeah, I can get behind that. I write uh, a lot of stuff that's considered to be science fantasy too, so I can relate to that. I do a lot of stuff where it's the science fiction tropes, you know, like it's space opera, right? But everything's powered by magic. There's no science involved, <laughs> right? So yeah, I get that. That's cool. That's great. Amy, your turn. Oh, boy. We're starting off with an easy one, right? Uh, so <laughs> I, would have to, I would have to say that when I think of it, when I think of science fiction, you know, it, it more has to do with when things are happening. So as an example, like 80 years ago, or a, yeah, people walking around like we do now with iPhones, to them, that's science fiction. But today, it's Wednesday, right? Or well, I don't know what day today is. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Saturday, I think. <laughs> so when I, when I think of that, the, it, in big terms, it's I always think of it in a, in a future sense. I always think of it chronologically speaking, you know, uh, what that's – because I know that a lot of people think of science fiction in terms of what's hard sci-fi and what, you know, what is, you know, the not so hard sci-fi. And it, to me, it's just, it is a broader sense. It has to do with chronologically how it occurs. So for you, <laughs> to that? Hey, hey, you know what? This is the internet. We can be quirky. <laughs> We're not on NBC, you know, it's all cool. Yeah. Um, so for you then the definition of science fiction changes over time right yeah. because as we use more technology in our everyday lives that right. ceases to be science fiction yeah. and becomes contemporary and and it's not just uh technology too it's it's how we think of ourselves in the world and regard and you know and it also can comp it can include a future that you hope doesn't exist too Look at the Handmaid's Tale in 1984. So. We will have a dystopia panel at some point. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's cool. And I think that's a valid argument. Um, there's uh, a board on uh, National Novel Writing Month. There are forums. I do it every year. There's a, a board where, you know, okay, so post about if you write science fiction and every year there's an argument in it about what qualifies as science fiction. And that is a valid viewpoint. And, yeah. you know, I, I get it. And, you know, I, I maybe the rest of the panelists will want to discuss that. And that's cool. Alan, what's your opinion? So I, I really don't even like the term science fiction. I prefer speculative fiction. And I just like to fit everything underneath that umbrella, kind of the opposite of what Divya was saying a little bit. Um, I had a, a conversation with Sam Miller and my co-host Jeremy a few months ago. And, you know, everything is so intermingled these days and mixed up that I, I don't even see the point of, you know, picking them apart at this point. Everything is just... Just let's put it in one big pile. If you like it, you like it. If you don't, you don't, you know, and a good story is a good story. And that's really what it comes down to. And that's fair too, I think, you know, why, why separate things, right? Um, some people- yeah, I get behind that. <laughs> yeah, right? some, I, some people, oh no, go ahead, sorry. Oh, no, I was gonna say, I can, I can totally get behind it from uh, the author standpoint of writing fiction and writing speculative fiction. It's, it's definitely an umbrella term. And I think it's crossed over now into the, you know, literary world that used to keep itself very apart from genre fiction, right? Now there's a lot of bleed there too. So it's why do we make that distinction anymore other than marketing at bookstores that are sadly going out of business? Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
But it's interesting. It's been an interesting thing to work with Escape Pod and the whole Escape Artist family of podcasts because each of our podcasts is supposed to have is supposed to represent a different genre. So at some point, sitting in the editorial chair, I have to make that call. Does this story work for our audience or should it go over to Podcastle because it's fantasy or is it too much horror? And so I've had to actually spend some time thinking about it. And uh, and I do get into discussion sometimes with my co-editors or assistant editor about, well, do we run this? You know, we love this story. Does it matter? We kind of want it for ourselves. Maybe technically it should go to one of our other podcasts, but we think it's awesome. So that's when that fuzzy line really starts to uh, to solidify for me. And I was thinking one of the other things I often look for in science fiction is science. Is there any scientific process or thinking by the characters or as part of the story, scientific discovery? You don't see it quite as much today in stories, <laughs> I feel like, as you used to. Mm -hmm. But often it's kind of there subtly that, you know, is the person thinking about this weird thing? Are they wondering why it happens phenomenally, you know? And um, that can also decide things for us, like steampunk being kind of a classic example, right? People are working with, you know, forces that don't exist today and it's kind of second world magical, but kind of not. But they often approach it as engineers and scientists investigating you know, the physics of their world. Yeah. Well, and this is the case where we were talking about things really do um, have gotten um, sort of messy. I mean, uh, fundamentally, I mean, we also have to accept the fact, as has been alluded to, that um, a lot of what science fiction and fantasy and horror are, um, are easily marketable terms so that when our sales departments go to booksellers or to Amazon or whomever, um, there's something that uh, we can say, this is what it is, this is where you slot it. So they know where to put it in the bookstore um, and that everybody's happy with that. Uh, I have a tendency to think, and this annoys really super old school science fiction people uh, to some extent, but I, you know, it is what it is, um, that if you are going to think of an umbrella term for everything that we're, that we're doing, um, ultimately everything that we do uh, classic fantasy, science fiction, horror, speculative fiction in general, really resides under the, you know, taxonomically uh, under fantasy. It is all, we are making up stuff. Um, and uh, for folks who are science forward, obviously this feels kind of offensive. They're like, how dare you call it fantasy? It's like, well, it is fantasy. <laughs> you know, if you are using, if you are using faster than light drives, uh, even if you are appositing um, that it that it has a rational basis, which it generally speaking does. Um, fundamentally, you are bumping up against everything that we know about the universe. Um, so it is a fantastical element, and it's okay to admit it to ourselves that that is uh, what we are doing. But I think uh, uh, Divya, you are absolutely correct. If you're thinking about science, if you're thinking about the rational basis, if uh, on a phen uh, phenomenal basis. Um, you are looking to the laws of nature um, to be the undergirding for whatever you do, even if fundamentally you are undergirding those uh, uh, laws with um, a fantastical basis, it's still going to end up kind of uh, more science fictional than not. Yeah, that was uh, one of my favorite aspects when I read Brandon Sanderson's uh, Mistborn series. I'm like, oh my gosh, he's setting up magic as a science in his world, right? There, there were very specific rules behind how these things worked. And to my engineer's brain, that had a lot of appeal because I'm like, oh, I can make sense of this. It's not just totally arbitrary free for all, something that just happens to you. It is a real physical phenomenon in that world. and uh, and. I would probably call that, oh, that's kind of science fantasy, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. sure. Andre Norton did a lot of great stuff like that. Her Witch World series is, it's, you know, like where where is it technology and where is ma is it magic? It's really hard to tell, right? Because for all we know, it's just the laws of physics work differently in this parallel universe where the Witch World is, right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I, I hear you. I hear what you're saying. Yeah, I think... 
that's that that's that peak that John's kind of talking about where the science and the fantasy just be, kind of become the same thing where it's so far in the future, you know, yeah. it could just be either one. And right? it's possible to ruin a really good science fantasy by pretending that it is actually science fictional. One of the things that everybody in the Star Wars universe has sort of decided to forget ever happened um, and midi is. Is the midi <laughs> menace, it's like, we're going to give the force a scientific basis. It's like, no, <laughs> why would you do that? One, uh, because the force worked perfectly well as the force was working. But second of all, it opens up all sort of like really sort of uh, fundamentally, essentially like uh, almost racist things. It's like your ability of force is really due to a concentration of you know, these little bugs that are in your system. Um, and some people have more and some people don't, but what if you could like, and then you get into things like, well, on the black market, I've got this highly concentrated vial of midichlorians injected. <laughs> How <laughs> are they transmitted? Right. <laughs> just, just let the force be the force. And, and certainly after the, this, uh, you know, after the, the prequel series, which I don't know has it ever actually happened. I just hear rumors <laughs> that it did. Um, we all sort of decided it was like, and eh, we're not going to think about midichlorians. I'm <laughs> pretty much. Yeah, because you get into all these questions, right? You, the old Republic stuff. Okay, so I'm a Star Wars nerd, right? And, <laughs> you know, then you're like, wait a minute here. Why is this love forbidden thing between Jedi? That doesn't make any sense because if it's passed down through families, which is what you're trying to tell us, you should be breeding kids en masse. What are you doing? You should be cloning them. Come on. Right? Well, technically, maybe that's their way of, of controlling it as well. You know, it's almost like some sort of eugenics breeding program. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, which again opens up that whole whoa, there's some serious ethics we really did not want to get into, right? Yeah. Ready? Yeah. Ready? Midichlorians do not exist. <laughs> <laughs> what are you talking about? I, I can't remember. Uh, <laughs> I still I still think I'm gonna make my kids watch the first three. I'm I'm gonna make them watch the the actual the ones from the seventies first, and then the new ones, and then after they get a little bit older. Watch the first one and be like, yeah, these are kind of like the bastard children, you know. <laughs> we like, should have all of them. Have you talked to your children about the prequel trilogy? <laughs> and have a very serious conversation about how that works. But this goes to the point that, you know, um, that science fiction is not inherently a better genre um than fantasy or horror or anything that's kind of in the, in between simply because it has a rational basis there is a lot of um a lot of ways that science fiction uh can go wrong by bad science bad rationalism uh bad ex uh, explanations one of the things that i always tell people um and you can argue with me about it or not, but I'm going to stick my guns with it, uh, is the smartest thing you can do is not over explain your technology. Because the more you explain, mm -hmm. uh, the more someone who is a oh, super my. nerd, um, and I mean that in a positive sense, is going to come up to you and like, you said this thing about like, you know, vectors <laughs> and thrust, and it's just really wrong. And I'd like to go on for 40 minutes in this question explaining why you're wrong. And then you're trapped. So yeah, I've had that. Yeah. Uh firsthand with my minimal amount of hard science fiction out at this point. But especially, I think the danger is even worse with writing near future science fiction. Mm -hmm. Because you're so close to reality that people are like, well, I know about this subject. And the more you get into the details, the more places there are for you to pick all of that apart. So I totally agree with you. And I, that's a, definitely a piece of advice I tend to give people. It's like, let's, let's not get into the details, you know, unless it's really, <laughs> really relevant yeah. to the story. Just it's better to gloss over it because then those people who do have expertise mm -hmm. will fill it in right. in their own minds in a way that makes sense. If yeah. you try to explain it badly, you are going to break them out of the story and they're going to be sitting there going, no, nah, that's BS. So like, I, I don't buy any of this. I'm not going to finish reading it. Yeah, I wonder how somebody like Kim Stanley Robinson deals with this because he goes into such great detail with some yeah, of his I wonder technology. Too. You know, I think what he does is he actually talks to humans that know what he wants to talk about. Um, <laughs> and therefore, when he does this, you know, uh, in, in, and he's probably somewhere in the acknowledgments. It's like everything that I've got mm -hmm. correct is uh, is there. Uh, doing everything that I've gotten wrong is my fault. 
Um, but there is something to be said that if you are going to go deep into like hard science fiction or something like that, you really should talk to people who know more than you um, because they will read it anyway. Um, and much better to have them tell where you, you where you're wrong early so that you can fix it before it goes out um, than for them to tell you it's wrong while you're on a book tour or making a presentation. <laughs> No, I have two engineers in my life. They're my husband, who's an engineer, and my good friend, Carl. And they're my consultants. So if I have something in this, I'm like, I want to do this. Does this make sense? And try to explain it like you would to a third grader and explain it back to me. <laughs> yeah. I'm not scientifically minded in that regard. I was like, would it work? And they're like, well, you'd have to do this, this, this. And I'm like, would it work? <laughs> Just yes or no. Let's move on from there. Because I know I'm not going to write that hard sci-fi aspect. Actually, I start to try to think about it and I have to go take a nap. So <laughs> yeah. that's what works for me, you know, and I am not going to be the person that tries to explain everything. And I apologize to anybody that would want me to do that, but I'm not. <laughs> well, it can slow down the story so much too, yes. right? Like the legendary mm -hmm. info dump. Yes, you know? I don't want that. Okay, yeah. well, I don't I don't feel bad but you know singling him out but okay, I love David Weber. I love him. I do. I think he's amazing. I love Honor Harrington. I read everything he puts out in that series. But I don't need five chapters about how the ship works. I usually just kind of skim through that. Right. But there's an entire genre of reader who yeah. lives for that sort of thing. It's the <laughs> the science fiction equivalent of the people who read all the Tom, Tim, uh, Tom Clancy books to have all those great descriptions of the weapons, or the people in fantasy who love getting all that amazing detail about what they're wearing and you know what's on the you know feast table and so on and so forth. There's mm -hmm. there's definitely a group of readers within the speculative fiction umbrella who loves uh, loves 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 the info dump. Um, and so every, for everybody who rails against the info dump, and I don't particularly like them myself, um, there are, you know, there's an audience for the people who's like, do tell me more. I love this. This is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I, oh, it's, yeah. it's brocade. It's amazing. You know, so, um, you know, to make a defense for um, David Weber and George <laughs> Martin and everybody else who goes on for pages and pages and pages where you're like, just, just get to the story. Um, <laughs> there are, you know, there is an audience for it. There's a reason why fantasy and why space opera are these huge, thick yes. books. Um, because to the be fair, are, right? To be fair to David Weber too, right? I mean, yeah, you're right. Like, yeah, there's, there's, you know, the extra nerdy nerds out there who are really into that and cool, you know, right? But um, to, to be fair, too, if, you, if you're if you going in, in into a story and you're going, wait a minute, okay, the tactics were all different in the space combat last time I read here. What happened? He'll tell you why. All that mm -hmm. stuff about the, the five chapters about how the, the spaceships work, right? The, that explains it. It makes sense because like any war, there's an arms race when the technology changes, the tactics change. Mm -hmm. So if, I gotta say, and, and, as oh, a man ahead. writer, keeping track of all those details has to be stressful as hell. <laughs> it's I don't, kind of fun too. To <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I, I, an I, yeah, I'm an engineer and I have a science background. I was gonna be, I started out in physics and neuroscience. So it's like, I, I love that writing fiction allows me an excuse to go read paper abstracts, you know, and the internet being the internet now, I can find them for free. So I, I love geeking out on it. I, and, uh, and keeping those details in my head and coming up with, hey, what is this cool new technology that I can invent? What would work or go, you know, and, and of course it's fun to go like way out into the future, right? And where it's just like, now it's just magic. I can just do whatever I want, but, bringing it in it is really neat to to flip through you know issues of nature or scientific american and be like look at this thing and now i could you know and then the all of the possibilities start spinning out and yeah writing it into a, a novel uh has been hard <laughs> but also really really fun because it's like how do i keep it consistent right and in what ways does each of these pieces shape 
our society today and how might they shape a society 50 or 60 years from now? I think that's um, Neil Gaiman said once, you know, just as an observation, which is entirely correct, that anybody who's writing knows much more about their universe um, than ever gets onto the page, right? And that is a particularly in science fiction where you are having to do uh, so much significant world building um, that it becomes the question of how much do you detail, how much do you uh, actually. Uh, decide to tell people on how much you just keep for yourself. Now, um, and and I have a tendency to, uh, you know, have that information and keep it for, present it when it needs to be presented um, and otherwise keep it for the sequels and stuff like that. But, um, but there are some people who are just like, let me show you everything that I've done. And again, some people really love that. And Kat's with us. Yay. She made it. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> Sorry about that. I, I'm sorry, who are you? Uh, what, are you doing? what are you doing here? I think John and I, we still have to meet in ritual combat at some point. <laughs> Dance no, off. No, first you have to slay Stephen, who was the president between That's true. us. Right? That's true. In, in order to get to me. I left him alive strictly, strictly as a buffer. Okay. So that I have time to prepare for our ritual battle. And he's a martial artist, so that's that's actually a pretty good buffer. Yeah, I was I was really smart in choosing my successor. <laughs> <laughs> well, welcome, Kat. And if you don't mind, a, a quick intro and your immediate take on what is science fiction. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> All right, so uh, I'm Kat Rambo. I am the current president of CIFA, a uh, writer and editor. What is science fiction? Well, I mean, speculative fiction, which is fantasy and science fiction, is fiction that asks the question of what if. And I would say science fiction is the branch of that that uses thoughts about science to ask what if. Does that make sense? rather than magic. Sure. 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 Okay, it's genius. We're done. <laughs> yeah, we're done. We should all go home. No, um, your explanation is very similar to, it, it has uh, stuff in common with what John had to say, and it has stuff in common with what, well, actually, it has stuff in common with what everybody else had to say. It's just different <laughs> aspects of, of it, right? Um, there was an argument made that uh, I've, I think it was Amy, am I right? The argument that, or was it Divya? The, the science, uh, because science and the way we do things changes over time and stuff that used to be science, you know, fictional, uh, speculative is now commonplace. Mm -hmm. The definition of science fiction changes over time as well. If I mean, that's, that's a legitimate argument, I think, too. Right, so... Well and you could throw in the mix too, right? That, that science fiction is really always about our own time at the at the same time that it's talking about the future, right? Yeah, no, I agree with that. Do go on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, just, I think I said one pithy thing and then I expect someone else to take it and say brilliant stuff. Speaking no, no, of, you have, you have to make a tangent. Up. Uh, have you all seen the news about the floating robot assistant that's going up to the International Space Station? Yeah, cool no, stuff, right? Eh? <laughs> all the HAL jokes immediately popped out of the woodwork. Oh, uh -huh. It looks very uh -huh. cute, though. But that's uh, that's kind of speaks to Kat's point, right? That uh, what happened back then and how do we think of it now that it's actually finally happening in reality, we're sending AI to space. Uh, but we're not scared of it right now. It's not, not going to take over the space station. <laughs> not yet, anyway. Yeah, not yet. Well, I mean, we use we use uh, Google and uh, Assistant and Siri and uh, you know Alexa all the time too. And having said that, I just activated my Alexa, yeah. <laughs> um, and that's the point of why we're not worried about AI at this particular point. I don't know though that Android. What was it? Saudi Arabia recognized her as a citizen. She's pretty creepy. Yeah. <laughs> she worries me. <laughs> yeah. I don't know the rest of it though. Yeah, we live with it every day. We live with it on our phones. We live with it on our computers. We're like, yeah, the great robot uprising is probably not happening. 
right? No, but the great uh, the great uh, robot uprising will much more effectively sell us um, things that we don't need, mm -hmm. and eventually, yeah. <laughs> the apocalypse will not be them rising up to shoot us. It'll be uh, the robots burying us under our own greed and then taking over after you know we basically uh, ruined the world for ourselves. So like, well, that was easy to do. Now let's yeah. you know. Now it's comes great. the rise of the robots. So it's our. Wasn't there a Philip K. Dick story about that? They they redid it in the uh, the Philip K. Dick um, anthology series on Amazon. Can't remember um, what it's called though. Electric yeah, Dreams. I'm sure there Electric is. Dreams. Yeah. All right. So the seven minute lull. But actually, that's cool. <laughs> that gives me a chance to get back to some other things. Um, Okay, so we initially, when John gave his definition, right, he was like, okay, so this is the difference between science fiction and fantasy. And most of us think, okay, that's where the divide is. What is science fiction? What is fantasy? But not necessarily, right? There's lots of areas where science fiction crosses over with other genres. Um, was it Divya who brought up the literary crossover? Right? Where where is the difference between literary fiction and science fiction? Right? And um, yeah, so obviously uh, Ursula Le Guin believed that the definition was kind of pointless and she kind of rejected it out of hand, right? But then literary critics, apparently if you're a literary fiction critic, you're allowed to read Philip K. Dick and Ursula Le Guin, right? And Margaret Atwood, who doesn't think what she does is science fiction, and that's okay. Right. And otherwise, you know, it's all about aliens and, and stuff like that, which, <laughs> you know, and I, OK, can you can you see my my chip on my shoulder? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I don't think you're the only one. I mean, uh, I've discussed this with Jeremy quite a bit. Jeremy's my co-host and and he's an academic. But I think that whole literature category is just an academic thing more than anything. And again, uh, maybe to some degree. Uh, uh, a marketing thing as well, like the different yeah. genres we were talking about before. Well, and the other thing about it, I mean, I definitely, it is definitely a marketing thing. I mean, you know, there's a reason why Tor is a science fiction and fantasy publisher. Uh, and while, you know, and all the divisions of Macmillan kind of have their own specialty. These are marketing things uh, and it makes it easier to place and classify books. Marketing is not necessarily a bad thing, uh, if it helps people find the work that they are interested in. But I think that when we were talking about science fiction bleeding into lit fic and uh, other genres bleeding in as well, I, one of the things that we are discussing kind of is mode, right? Um, there, is the, there, is an, there is an argument that what we typically think of science fiction, the mode of it is primarily... Uh, technologically driven uh, problems, technologically driven solutions, whereas some of the lit fic that uses um, science fiction or fantasy, um, the mode of it is much more uh, interpersonal relationships or dealing with on a sort of granular level rather than on a technological level what are going on uh, with these events. And again, that uh, just doesn't really answer the question. It just opens up another uh, a battle of why is one considered one and one considered the other. Um, but to the extent that uh, people outside science fiction and fantasy are using elements of it, but still going, well, 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 but I don't know that it's science fiction. I think they are addressing uh, the issue of, you know, essentially mode. Okay, so I have a question about that, right? And the question is, then where's the line between uh, literary fiction with science fiction elements and soft science fiction, which deals with social issues? Hmm. It's Someone a blurry else. line, but I was going to say, I think there's also, um, to kind of speak to John's point, there's a difference between the short fiction world and the novel world, because mm -hmm. in a long form story, like a novel or a series, you have more room to explore the technologically driven plot. In a lot of short stories, at least the ones that come across um, my desk, they tend to be character and relationship driven because you only have, you know, so many pages. You don't have time to get into this huge 
society shaping technology situation, whatever, or your epic space battle is that you can't do an epic space battle galactic level conflict in 20 pages. You could try, uh, but chances are you're not going to succeed that well. So I think part of what maybe frustrates some people in the genre side is in short fiction, we do explore a lot of the things that lit fic traditionally explores, and they tend to ignore that. I mean, you look at somebody like Ted Chang. How <laughs> is that not literature in its purest form, right? So uh, that, I think that's another divide because, and of course, the audience for short fiction being very, very small compared to the general audience for novels, that those people especially don't see, um, don't see, I think, some of the best stories in genre, they tend to ignore it because we have segregated into genre short fiction magazines and lit fic short fiction magazines and never shall the two, you know, overlap. Although yeah. we do have, we have some magazines in the genre that are sort of more known for leaning towards literary. I mean, uh, Clark's World and, and Shimmer and Uncanny, I think are all ones that tend to go in that direction. And this is a question, I teach a class called uh, Literary Techniques for Speculative Fiction Writers. And so this is, we always kind of start out by sort of arguing this particular question. And uh, honestly, it's just, it's not, I'm with Ursula, right? I, I just, I think the good writers are using everything that they can and that to come too firmly down on one side or the other is to deny yourself uh, a lot of stuff, a lot of useful stuff. Yeah. yeah. One of the things that I talk about a lot, writing specifically about science fiction, um, is a really good way um, to make your science fiction boring um, is to ne never read outside the genre or ever bring anything from outside the genre. When people ask me, what, who are your favorite writers? And they're expecting me to go down a list of science fiction writers. And there are obviously science fiction writers, uh, both, you know, growing up and now that I admire. But, you know, I always point them towards, you know, uh, Carl Hyassen or Molly Ivins, who is a columnist, or Dorothy Parker or William Goldman or Ben Hecht, or James Thurber, um, where uh, they're not in genre at all, but they were formative uh, in how I looked at the world and how I approached writing. Um, and to the same extent uh, that you don't want to deny yourself as a writer um, any of the tools anywhere, because again, a question of mode, you can always incorporate um, speculative elements in whatever that it is that you decide you want to write, if such is your interest. By the same token, if you are only reading um, in your genre or what you define as your genre, um, then you do get epistemic closure. Um, and so the hybrid vigor of bringing in other elements is ultimately beneficial for you, whether you're writing science fiction or fantasy or horror or somewhere, somewhere in between. Um, so I think that people who are genre fans do think that there's a class issue going on. And to some extent, they're correct. The, mm -hmm. the people who come in from later was like, I'm not writing science fiction or signaling. No, you don't have to be a nerd to read what I write, which, of course, obviously offends nerds because it uh, makes it seem like we are, you know, off to the side. Uh, but at the same time, the uh, there is something to be said about uh, having open borders. Um, because it makes for it makes for better fiction. Period. I love that having open borders makes for better fiction. We should. Well, thank you. I, I, I'm yeah. open. Put that on Twitter or something. <laughs> That's cool. Damn, <laughs> <TM>, trademark. <laughs> but, but, but I, at the end of this uh, panel, I will have the the t-shirts ready to go. That's right. <laughs> there you go. I'm, I, I'm curious if any of you have had this experience um, when. So being a relatively new writer, right, I still have family members who actually read some of the stuff I write because they're excited that I published <laughs> something. <laughs> and none of them is a science fiction, fantasy, whatever, fan, right? They, they don't even watch half the movies. They definitely don't read in it. But they'll read one of my stories and they'll be like, this is really cool. I, I don't really like science fiction, but I like this. Mm -hmm. And it makes me sometimes want to tear my hair out just a little bit because I'm like, 
But this, this is science fiction today. You're still thinking, you know, they're like, well, you know, Asimov and Herbert and blah, blah, blah. Like they go back to Bradbury and they can't come into the present. And I'm like, today, many of us are writing science fiction fantasy like what I write. And I feel like there's a world of people out there who just were kind of stuck in, you know, 50, 60 years ago in their conception of what it means. Yeah. Um, so I don't know. Have you have you guys run across this ever? My my think... wife and I have a joke. Uh, our joke is that she hates science fiction, but all of her favorite movies are science fiction. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how that works out, but <laughs> I, I I've kind of encountered this. I think there's like a certain stigma. I I can't think of a better word to describe it, but like a stigma. Uh, so if I, I have coworkers that they're mundane, they I I have a mundane day job, right, and they're. And I explained to them, I write science fiction and their eyes kind of glaze over a little bit. They're thinking, you know, I think they're having like some sort of galaxy quest flashback moment or something like, oh, a nerd, you know. <laughs> and so I, there is that certain, you have to kind of overcome that. And, it, mm -hmm. and so I actually do have some coworkers who read my book. I traded her for chocolate. <laughs> and she's like, oh, it's actually a pretty good story. And I'm like, oh, hey, and it's science fiction. And nobody, you know, made you come to a Star Trek convention or anything like that, you know. So there is a stigma that's involved. And I, I do recall, you know, back when I was starting writing and, and entertaining the thought of traditional publishing, um, applying to be part of a group of people that considered themselves literary uh, writers and as a, a work group. And uh, basically, I was rejected just offhand because my interest was writing science fiction. And they said, well, we don't identify that as literary. And so I'm like, oh, OK, that's kind of a jerky thing to say. But, you know, but so needless to say, I didn't never join that group. <laughs> right. Uh, I read a lot of. Oh, no, go ahead. Uh, but I was just going to say the, the thing for me uh, with regard to that is. It's always it is always funny to me that there is kind of that snobbery there um, for for two reasons. One, uh, as Divya mentions, I mean, there's so much uh, in science fiction right now that is just flatly amazing uh, writing um, that to you know characterize it as what people thought of it as science fiction 40 years ago is 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 frustrating. Um, but the other aspect of it is is I do think that's just the nature of of genre itself. I mean the uh, one of the issues is, you know, people think about, you know, uh, literature as being, you know, very specific things, and they forget that the primary engine of publishing, uh, and Kat knows where I'm going with this because I can see her nodding, the primary <laughs> engine of publishing um, is uh, romance, which is literally 40% of the market in, uh, you know, in traditionally published and is even more uh, in uh, you know self-published and and micro publishing, um, and so part of the thing for everybody to remember every time that you know someone goes well I don't usually read that is that you know um, what people say that they read is basically the tip of the iceberg of what is actually read and what is below the surface that is fantasy that is horror that is romance it, oh god is it romance um and in science fiction um there is still more than enough room um for us to do what we want to do and whether we get acknowledged by uh people who don't read science fiction or don't read romance or don't read westerns um doesn't change the fact that we are still writing to a mass audience and i want to actually my mother has been a lifelong uh reader of romances and about 10 years ago, she was like, I guess you're writing this fantasy and science fiction stuff. I will start reading it. And so it's been kind of fun introducing her to stuff. But she came to World Fantasy with me a few years back and actually was on a panel where someone dissed the romance writers. And she got up and basically said, you people have no room to talk. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is cool. Everything that's been discussed here, I'm going to try to make it brief because I have like three things to say. Um, to answer Divya's question, yes, I've had that experience. I write a lot of stuff that's kind of, I mean, it sounds really out there when I describe it, for example, right? I write a, a dystopian, post-apocalyptic, steampunk, fantasy western, <laughs> right? Sounds freaking bizarre, doesn't it? But you know what? Everybody who's read it says, 
wow, this is cool. I had, I thought this was going to be crazy, but no. Right. So, you know, and yeah, mostly that's my friends and family, but you know, right. But my mother won't read anything I've written. Because oh. <laughs> she hates oh, speculative man. fiction. She just has no use for it at all, right? So that was a bit challenging growing up. I've been doing this since I was 10, right? So, you know, okay, so there's that, right? Um, John was talking about the expansion of science fiction into the mainstream. And it's almost like it's stealth science fiction is one of the, the things I'm, I'm thinking of there, right? Um, I worked in a bookstore. And in the bookstore, generally the rule was if you could pass it off as not science fiction and fantasy, you put it in general fiction. Why? It sold better. Right. And that's, you know, like that just makes me insane. Right. It makes me absolutely crazy. There's all these great films out right now, you know, I mean, come on, Marvel is clearly science fiction, you know, and everybody watches Marvel, you know, and all these yeah. thriller movies that they do, these near future thriller movies that star Tom Cruise or whatever, right, you know, they're, they're science fiction, they're clearly science fiction, often they're even based on classic science fiction novels, and people are like, well, I don't know, I'm just watching this thriller, you know, Right. Well, me, Clive Kuchler writes books that use speculative elements in his fiction. He's one of the most popular mainstream writers out there right now. Yeah, it, and it makes me crazy. Well, let me address that real quick, but because I, I think there's an important point here, which is that um, people approach. Uh, it's th it's not that this is a science fiction problem. Um, it is that it is a medium problem. Uh, people approach uh, film and television and video games. Um, differently than they uh, than they approach books, um, and that the audience for books um, sees itself um, even if it does go see science fiction movies and it does go see science fiction television uh, and plays video games that are science fictional um, does see uh, itself as a little bit divided. Uh, there, it is one thing to go see a Star Wars film; it's yeah. another thing to buy a uh, Star Wars novel. And that is a perceptual problem that genre writers specifically um, still have still have to deal with. One of the great ways to sell millions and millions and millions of copies of your books um, is to get a movie or TV show made out of your work, because then um, they no longer they don't have that perceptual hump to get over. They'll be like, oh, Game of Thrones or oh. Annihilation, which is the uh, Jeff Endemir's new thing. Um, so for us, it's not even so much that there's mass acceptance of science fiction. That's a done deal. Um, it is that in our particular line of work, uh, for most of us, um, it is reminding people that they do love science fiction and that the perception that they have of it not being something that they really like um, is related specifically to the medium of books. And we need to get over that. That's and a good book, point. The book marketing thing, I feel like, has, has gotten really interesting, too, uh, looking at the burgeoning young adult and now separate even from that, the teen fiction section, right? I don't know if you guys have noticed that at the bookstores. Oh, I walked yeah. in, I'm like, now there's YA and there's teen, and then there's everything else. And I, at least what I heard originally was that that helps, again, to sell books. But yeah. it's like we're drawing more distinctions instead of less, even though, you know, classic, classic works, especially when I think of genre fiction, something like Ender's Game, that's basically YA, right? Or, you know, mm -hmm. Harry Potter crosses over, it's just a n number of things. So then it becomes, well, does the readership really need to have these things segregated? And then are we making it harder for them to find the science fiction that they're going to love because they don't wander out of that section? I think that's a very good point. I was just, I went into a bookstore yesterday, right? I'm looking around, right? Half the store is young adult fiction and teen fiction, right? About 70% of which is science fiction or fantasy as we would define it right and then wedged into the back corner in the darkest place in the room <laughs> is the one shelf of science fiction and fantasy where you can find the same 18 books that every bookstore is selling right now right, right. It, ah, okay yeah <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I find myself going to the role-playing section, and even though I've been playing role-playing games since I was 12, I kind of, like, 
look around a little bit to see who's watching me. <laughs> I don't know why. I don't know why. I've been doing it all my life, you know. It's because you've been, you've it's because you've been trained for it. I mean, uh, speaking as one of the eighteen people who actually yep. get put in the books. Um, I mean, one of the things that uh, I know Tor in particular, with Tor, by the way, uh, having just sort of reorganized itself uh, uh, it, with Tom ascending, Tom Doherty ascending to chairman, Fritz Foy now being the publisher of Tom Doherty, uh, and uh, Davey now moving up to publisher of Tor. Uh, one of the things that it's actually done a very good job of is getting uh, uh, getting us out of the shelf right and we have no reason to complain everybody else is in their own shelf as well right um but uh making that migration to the front of the store which is a perceptual issue now with the case of books and, and again to go back to marketing some of that is being willing to pay for things like co-op which means you know the bookstores pay or the bookstores get paid to put you in the front of the store. So making the effort to do that, uh, you know, getting uh, people out on tour, getting them uh, out there in terms of not just in genre publications, but in EW and in Variety and and in other places like that. Um, and this is one of the things that is that is also difficult to remind people that the perceptual problem is not just about the genre in and of itself. It is also about the sheer mechanics of getting to the front of the store. Um, and it is even harder, and Amy, I'd love to hear you speak about yeah, this. Yeah, I was just yes. thinking about that. How it's like, <laughs> it's, it's very much the traditional uh, versus indie thing. So in indie publishing, and you know, the the big, uh, the big part is, is Amazon, and Amazon actually kind of forces you to categorize yourself. There are all these uh, schools of thought on the marketing of your book about how you're supposed to pick the right categories. And these are arbitrary categories. These are categories they decided are going to be part of science fiction or, and or fantasy. And you mm -hmm. actually have to go above and beyond to create a new or like a little sub area of that in order to kind of create, you know, where you're going to go with your book. You can ask them to, but you, it limits you to then to, you have one of their choices and you have to go with one of your own choices and you have to be able to basically prove that your book fits <laughs> in that category. So the onus is on you. It's like you're defending yourself in some kind of court. And, uh, and it's not really gonna push you to the front of the store and you are already automatically limiting your options because you're trying to guess how someone is going to search in a virtual environment for your book in an area that's already saturated, saturated with books, you know, and it is a very different beast, you know, and it's an entire panel into its, of itself, you know, that self-promotion. Sure. Yeah. yeah, I'm a hybrid writer, so I can address that too. I, yeah. I do a lot of independent stuff as well. And it's, you know, like, and, and they're weird, right? Yeah. These categories is stuff like time travel. It's going to be its own separate category yeah. that has nothing to do with either science fiction or fantasy yeah. if you're going to look for it, right? Dystopian, there's another one, right? right? They put that in its entirely own category. You know, is it young adult? They ask you what uh, what age right. range it's targeted for. I don't know, right? You know, I, I wrote the book, right? I think you might enjoy it if you're a teenager, right. but I'm pretty sure you'll like it if you're 50. I don't know, right? Yeah, and, and uh, that guesswork and then trying to get your voice heard above all this other stuff that's out there that nobody knows anything about because it's not like independent authors have their own uh, you know, marketing person working for them like traditional mm -hmm. publishers do, right? The, there's nobody to phone to get you on all the radio shows, right? You have to try to do that yourself. And, you know, they don't want to talk to you, right? Lots of people are dismissive of indie writers in the first place. There seems to be this perception that everything they write is crap. Um, I think the crap is about equal ratio, regardless of what medium you publish in, yeah. right? But, uh, you know, and then there's, some people will categorize their books at, in a category that doesn't really quite fit, but sort of does, just because there's not a lot of people in that category, and it's easier to get to the bestseller list in that yes. category, at which point, you get noticed and Amazon starts doing some advertising for you, which otherwise they cannot be bothered to do. Right. So yeah. yeah. Right. And it's all so, algorithms and guesswork. 
It is, and it's, it actually kind of creates two different types of writers. So, and, and this is kind of how I've been categorizing. You've got the people who are basically writing because they're like, I'm going to write for this category and get myself a little uh, push or a boost up in Amazon because I'm writing for this category. That's going to get me to the top and it's going to elevate it. So they're writing to the actual market. And then you've got the author that just wants to write what they were going to write. And then they find themselves in the position of trying to figure out a category that's going to work for them. So you got the people I've been encountering in interacting online and in the, um, you know, like email sharing groups and stuff, they're writing books specifically for a category or to even take advantage of a, um, an underutilized category in order to get pushed to the top. And another thing too, right, um, like any form of internet platform and social media, the best way to get attention is put out content, mm -hmm. right? So there's a lot of people who are writing as fast as they bloody can. They right? write and a book a month and, and it's un unreal. It's unreal. I, can, I cannot do this. Wow. No. I cannot do this. <laughs> it, it, they write us as, as quickly as romance authors. And I know that romance authors are real producers. I mean, they write literally will write until their fingers bleed. You know, that's how fast they can type. And it's amazing, you know, and hats off to them. But I can't, I have to actually think I need a little bit of time to think about what I'm doing. You know? Sure. It, it's like that in the podcasting world too. The more that you can put out, you know, the more people are going to see you, the more people are going to come and listen to you. And, you know, my, my, my host, my co-host and I, you know, we've got day jobs and stuff and we've both got kids, you know what I mean? Like we have all this other stuff going on and there's podcasts putting out four, five episodes a week. How do you do that? I don't know. <laughs> College students. <laughs> Yeah, serious. <laughs> College students with no life. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I admire them. I admire people who can produce like that, but I just yeah. can't do it, you know? I so, can. yeah, but that's that's the internet, right? If you, if you want attention, put out as much stuff as you possibly can and put as many hashtags on it as you think you can get, and then maybe yeah. your, your wide net will cast something in it, right? Well, I, I, I mean, to, to go on the flip side of that, I mean, a lot of that is not about um, – it's not about the fiction. It's not about science fiction or not about fantasy. It is more about just keeping a perception. I mean, certainly while I was uh, building a name, equally as important to what I was writing in fiction was the fact that I that I had the blog. Um, and these days, um, the fact that I am on Twitter on a, on a regular basis um, is uh, equally important uh, perceptually. I don't no, and I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna argue with regard to a a uh, process that I'm not participating in actively with regard to um, uh, independent writers. But I will say, with regard to what I do, um, it is less about uh, for me putting out um, fiction all the time as just maintaining a a certain level of awareness. And then when I do put out fiction. Um, making sure that for me, it's less of constantly putting something out as opposed to making sure that when it does come out, that it that it's an event. And again, we're talking about the business side of how uh, what science fiction is, rather than you know talking about the 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 term itself. Um, but that is that is an aspect of how to do it in traditional. Well, I think it it relates right because. The business aspect of science fiction is kind of what's driving this distinction in the market. And sure. if your story can speak to more people, I mean, there's the commercial side of it of just selling more books, but there's also the the more kind of social side of it, right? You're, you're telling a story, if it's an important story and it's gonna speak to someone and change their life, how do you get your book into that someone's hands, you know, or how does that person find you in order to have that experience? Right, right. And I think that, that that's a tough question just as much for the indie authors as for traditionally published, right? Is, is getting the word out there and convincing people that, hey, you might actually like what's in these pages, you know, short of the all powerful word of mouth. <laughs> Well, also, and I think and this goes back actually to the issue of what is science fiction. I mean, a lot of um, what we consider to be science fiction ultimately does not have to be timely. It does have to speak to people. The backlist 
for the traditional publishers, the backlist is where you eventually make all of your money, right? Where people are discovering and rediscovering uh, what it is that you have already put out and, and that, you know, for them speaks to them. And a lot of that's going to come to character. A lot of that is going to come to whatever the technology is. And the technology, as mentioned before, is always a moving target. Um, how the, the people in the story respond to the technology and by reflection, how uh, the reader is going to respond to the characters dealing with that. I mean, people do still read uh, Frankenstein, the modern Prometheus, even though obviously we know that technology isn't going to work. People are still obviously reading Ender's Game, uh, even though the, you know, that book was published 40 years ago. Um, the, because it does fundamentally come down to not only what technology is there, um, but how are we responding to it and how do we relate to, to that response? Um, and so um, ultimately, uh, in science fiction, as with so many other genres, I think uh, character matters. That is a really good point. Yeah, I mean, that's what it comes down to, isn't it? I mean, that's the story. How does this speculative factor affect the people? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and if you can't communicate that, the story is not interesting, right? Sure. Yeah. So, I just want to let people know we are at the hour mark from where we started. I'm quite happy to carry on if people want to, but Kat probably has places to be, and I'm sure everybody else has a busy life too. <laughs> so, you know, um, perhaps we should think about winding this up. I'd love to hear some final thoughts from people if you have something you want to say that we haven't addressed yet or comments you want to make. I, I think I just did my final thoughts. So <laughs> that's <did>. awesome. <laughs> I just I want to say so I'm at Emerald City Comic Con uh, this weekend. I'm about in fact to head back there, and one of the things I've been doing this weekend is trying to find independent writers and talk to them about CIFWA and what CIFWA has to offer. Because one of the things that the organization is trying to do is figure out values that we can add in terms of marketing and discoverability, like the new release newsletter and the NetGalley program and stuff like that. So if people are at Emerald City Comic Con, please come say hi, I'll be wandering around. Thank you, that's great. All right, um, if you guys will indulge me then, I'll just spend a few minutes talking about, or hopefully a minute or two, talking about what we have coming up next on our panel programs. Um, so I've decided to set kind of a regular routine now. We're going to do the panel on the first weekend of the month, and we're going to do Spec Women Chat on the third weekend of the month. Date and time will be more specifically announced as we get closer to it because it depends upon panelist availability. Our next topic for the March panel for Spec Women Chat is going to be speculative romance because as we've mentioned, right, there's a huge market out there for romance, but romance tends to be considered a marginalized genre. People don't think of it as good writing, which is very odd because there, I mean, there's so many stories out there and good writers who write romance as part of something else and or in addition to, right, and it's so important. I mean, where would the original Star Wars trilogy be without Leia and Han, right? Like, you know, it's part of the story. It's one of the things that motivates us as as people. Hey, even even John had romance in Old Man's War. So, <laughs> I mean, you know, it's very, kind of a backstory, but it's there, right? It's very important. That's very right. Important. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So, um, so what do I mean by speculative romance? I mean, if it contains a speculative element and it's also a romance story, right? So um, we're going to have some indie writers. We're going to have some traditionally published writers. Again, the final panel will be uh, announced when it is finalized. So that's coming up third weekend of March. And then the first weekend of April, our next episode of the panel is going to be a bookend to this one, which is what is fantasy? So we're going to focus on the fantasy writers and editors and so on for that one. And I have no idea who's going to be on that panel yet. I'm chasing <laughs> dust of leaves. <laughs> 
Okay, well, thank you very much, everyone, for being here. I have had a great time, and I hope that you'll all consider keeping in touch. And uh, I guess I'll see everybody again in a couple of weeks. Yeah. Sounds good. Thank you. Sounds good. Thanks, everyone. Nice to meet you guys. Take care. Bye. Nice to meet you. Bye. Bye.